Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us here today for this very special edition of an IP Watchdog webinar sponsored by IPlytics. We are going to go for 90 minutes today, and we're giving free CLE for those who need CLE, uh, which probably is every attorney, whether your state requires CLE or not, your malpractice carriers probably require or encourage CLE. So we have a robust discussion uh, to go over. We will make sure that Renee sends everybody the um, articles that uh, were approved for to go along with this uh, seg this CLE program, um, so that you'll have the articles. You can write also uh, download uh, the presentation as we go forward. So I'm just looking at folks coming in now. And we're up over 250 attendees, so I suppose that we could probably get started. So, so the first order of business is accessing the slides. So everybody always wants to access the slides. We have the slides here in the handout section. So if you're listening to this on the uh, computer, You'll have a go to webinar control panel and in that control panel you'll see a tab that says handouts the slides are in that particular tab that says handouts i'll also ask renee to put the articles that were sent to the cle the states that were approved to go along with this um uh, cle presentation so that you have those substantive articles that you may need to hold on to in your states to um, demonstrate attendance uh, the, the nice thing about GoToWebinar as a platform is we don't have to do any polling or creative things online to ask whether you're here or not. GoToWebinar monitors whether you're here or not when you arrived and when you leave. So we can just have a good conversation. If you do have a question, there's a questions tab here on the GoToWebinar control panel as well. So that's how you will ask your questions. I'll monitor the questions and weave them into the greatest extent that I can. And if we can't get to them during the ordinary presentation, we'll try and save a little bit of time at the end, to get to as many questions as we possibly can. So here's where we have been approved for CLE. Missouri, Tennessee, and Texas. We have also applied for CLE in Arkansas, California, Minnesota, Ohio, Oklahoma, and Virginia. We've gotten CLE for all of our programs in all of those states, so we suppose we will get approval in those states as well. New York attorneys can claim CLE because of reciprocity with all of Missouri, Tennessee, and Texas. And Arizona and New Hampshire attorneys know that the states do not approve CLE courses, attorneys self-determine. Renee has asked me to have you bear with her and do not inundate her with emails. What we will do is as CLE approvals come in, we will send everybody an email together with a link where you can get access to the CLE certificates. But please do take the survey at the end of the webinar so that you can tell us what states matter to you so that we make sure that we get you the right CLE certificate. So with no further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists. We have Kent Baker here today, and he is the head of intellectual property from Ublocks, and he is uh, going to talk to us about a number of different things, but in particular from the implementer side. Uh, Dave, and I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name, and I apologize. But Okay, Dave is president of Pac Tech Law, and Dave has uh, been emailing back and forth with me about FRAND issues, and, and we've worked out a poll question that we're, we're going to talk to you about. Uh, so happy to have Dave here with us. Clemens is with us here from uh, Nokia. He's the head of global litigation and Nokia. David Cohen, he is, uh, well, I met him first many years ago when he was chief IP counsel at Veringo, and now he has his own place at Kid in IP, and he blogs there as well. Uh, so check him out. And uh, last but certainly not least is Tim Pullman, who is CEO and founder of IPlytics. Um, so, gentlemen, what we're going to do here is pause at the agenda. And this is the text that everybody has already seen when they registered here for the webinar. Um, 
what I would like to ask you in uh, one to two minutes, if you can, and we'll go around the horn here, is what is it that you would like people to have in the front of their mind as we begin this conversation? And I ask this question so that really we bring people up to speed. What knowledge do you want them to have? What would you like them to focus on as we try and tackle in 90 minutes this ginormous question of SEP litigation? Clemens, let's start with you. You drew Thanks the short stick. You drew the short <laughs> stick. <laughs> Okay, indeed. I try to stay as short as possible so that we have more time for discussions. So when it comes to SEP and Friend, let me just first tell you very few things about Nokia. So we are frequently on both sides of the courtroom. We have a big patent portfolio, more than 3000 standard essential patents to 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G and also other standards. Um, altogether more than 20,000 patent families, many implementation patents as well. So we have a licensing business which generates roughly um, 1.5 billion euros revenues. But the sounds maybe like quite a lot, but on the other hand, if you compare it to our R&D spend, that is about 4.5 million euros, um, um, billion euros uh, annually. So this means it is not at all the case that let's say um, patent licensing would be a money printing machine. It's just, it's actually trying to get some parts of the costs back. Um, when it comes to our product business, we are one of the biggest network suppliers and, and that is where we make kind of 90% of our revenue. So I'm just giving you these numbers because some people characterize Nokia as a patent troll, um, as let's say a company which was producing handsets sometimes um, decades ago and now it's just um, monetizing patents. So that is just wrong. We are still doing R&D. We are filing more than a thousand new applications every year, mainly for our product business. But here we come to friend and SEPs. We make them also available to, of course, everybody else on the market who wants to use them. And I think with the Big topics we will see soon now and um, soon will uh, are at the moment the anti anti suit injunctions or how many antis you want to use, and also of course the licensing level. I will come to that in one second. Let me first say that um, I think there is sometimes a wrong impression that license agreements are the result of litigation, of blackmailing, of threatening, and so on. That is just not the case. We have far more than 200 license agreements in place. And um, I think more than 190 out of those have been concluded without litigation, but just on the table. And that is actually how it should be. But we see also um, strategies on the other side. Of course, everybody wants to optimize their, their, their cost spend. So let's say we want to get good price. The other side wants to pay as little as possible. And so everybody plays his card that is somehow normal, somehow legitimate until at least within a certain frame. So. Um, what we do see indeed is that, let's say, some players indeed try to delay concluding license agreements. They try to always point at others. That is the famous issue, license to all, access to all, where they say, yes, um, somebody else should take the license, but not me. That is, these are things we are seeing, and these are things which also keep the courts busy at the moment. So I think two exciting questions at the moment are, first of all, who is entitled to a license, who should take a license. I think many people would agree that in a value chain. Well, Clemens, let, let me, let, let, let me, yes. let me inter interrupt you because what I like to do is go around the horn and get everybody's you know, preliminary thoughts before we get really into all the okay. stuff that we, what we really want to talk about here today. Um, Ken, let me turn to you to get your, your preliminary thoughts. What is it in, in a nutshell that you'd like folks to think about as we approach these these topics. I know you. I think you've been on both sides of this issue throughout your career, implement, implementer and and then also uh, patent R and D company. Up, oh, you're on uh, mute, Kent. Let's try that. Didn't have yeah, didn't work. The there first we go. Time. All right. Um, as you know, you can't mention CEP litigation or licensing without quickly finding yourself in a Fran valuation debate. I started my career on this over at Qualcomm, so I do know the licensure side. I do know the risk associated with an R&D investment. And I've both seen R&D investments that were abject failures from either a CEP or just a patent uh, monetization perspective. I've also seen successes. Um, 
after that, I ended up over at Palo Alto Research Center, which is a true innovation hub um, traditionally. And Apple built its credibility and its first computers off of a lot of the technology that came out of Palo Alto Research Center. And that was an event where you're taking truly novel innovations and trying to move them into a marketplace and find a market niche. Um, then with Park, I guess you could say I'm working my way down the ladder of success if you go by company size, because um, Ublox is a small component implementer. We make modules. The strength of the company has been on the GNSS side and as of the last 10 years, the cellular side. So there's been a tremendous learning curve. But one of the things I want people to appreciate is a lot of the discussions I hear today are deal with corporate policies or positioning. They are trying to apply traditional licensing methods that work very well. And I know they work very well. I was at Qualcomm at the time when we set up this monetization process. They work very well, but things have changed over the last 20 plus years. So I'd like everyone just to keep an open mind that many times what you need to be talking about are solutions and not the rhetoric that goes around the complaints about the positioning of each side. So I'm gonna be talking a bit today and mentioning some economic principles that are one method that are used in virtually all international markets and respective market segments. And I'll give you the perspective of a tier two or tier three supplier of what holdout really means to us and when you may think we're holding out, but we're not holding out. Okay, I look forward to that that conversation. Um, and uh, David, you 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 next. Um, what is it that you in 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 a, in a nutshell, if you can, because I know when you get wound yeah. up, you you're, oh, you're yeah. like Clemens, and when you two guys get talking, um, it's it's just we'll never sit stop. back and I I, sit back. I it's not I'll never stop. It's not never stop. It's sit back and just watch and absorb. Um, <laughs> and we'll get to that part of the segment. But um, you you've got you write so much about this topic. I mean, what part of this are you going to want to focus on today? Well, so when you take a big picture view of what's going on in SCP litigation and, and future trends, you know, I, I come back to one of my potted theories of, of, of SCP litigation history. And you have to always be careful because it's not always true, but they're useful heuristic tools. When there's convergence between different industries, that's when there's tensions. When So, you know, back in the day when uh, IT uh, bumped into telco. There were different licensing regimes and ways of, of licensing things, and that created a lot of tension. I think I would argue, in large measure, that's what contributed to the patent wars of, you know, Apple, Nokia, et cetera. Um, additionally, you know, and then once it sort of figured itself out, and and people know who pays for what on the various sides of the, you know, the the, the implementer and SCP owner, and and what what's how it's all going to be resolved. You know, then things calm down until the next big bump. And I think right now in the auto industry, one of the big challenges is that the for the, the for the patent owners is that the, the implementers haven't quite figured out who is the one who actually has to pay, and they're both pointing this way, and that's creating a challenge for the implementer for the for the SCP owners to to get you know to have a, a productive conversation. Although I'm sure Kent may disagree, but I, I think the general point is that um, when there's uncertainty uh, and different industries coming together, there is going to be uh, challenges. What um, I foresee for, you know, looking forward, I, I see a lot of, based on some of the research I've done with Eric Stasek and other folks, that the next iteration of, of, of the telco world will probably be very similar, but the one after that, so once things get super, maybe if you want to say, you know, artificially Rev 15 versus Rev 16 for 5G, uh, the the one after that, Rev 16, is going to be an open book because no one really knows where the money is because all these disputes ultimately end up being about who controls access to the key money points, and no one understands how it's all going to work, and we can talk about that. And I think that's really where a lot of people are positioning themselves to go to Kent's point to try to figure out ways to come up with models. And some people are wedded to old models. Some people are trying new models to figure out how to best position themselves for this new world whenever it does come. But I, I, I will say, having come from a smaller player, and uh, you know, I, I love the FRAND world and the SCP world, and it's, it's fascinating and, and it's addictive, frankly, uh, with all of its complexity and layers and aspects to it. But if you're a small, uh, you know, sp spare a moment for the small uh, patent owner uh, or, or, or innovator uh, and think about the regulatory burden that if they want to be 
a good player, and we can talk about whether they are or they aren't. I see some questions later. It's a real challenge to do everything right, and you generally don't get the benefit of it. And what ends up happening, in my view, and I'm on the record saying this, is that the, the regulatory regime that we're putting in place globally for SCPs is effectively making it an oligopoly for SCP owners, where only really major players can function and be on the right side of the law. And it's very hard to be a small-time SCP player, follow the rules, and uh, um, make money. Yeah. Okay, well, that's... Um, I think we're going to talk about more, more about that as we go through the substantive presentation. And I look forward to that discussion as well. Dave, your preliminary thoughts here. I think you are probably going to be more aligned with Kent, although I'm not sure. Although I think the emails we exchanged based on the Fran conversation kind of kind of tips your hand a little bit as to what you might want to talk about. But uh, anything on the table here, I mean, it's a big, huge topic. What are you focusing on? Well, well, sure. I, I mean, I, I think um, th that we need to start high level a little bit. What's happening? Um, I think that the agenda that you prepared and circulated uh, really gets at a, at, a, at a core issue that we're facing today. SEPs are no longer a telecommunications industry issue. It's no longer handset makers versus SEP holders. It's no longer something that these telecom giants are fighting about amongst themselves. It is now seeped into automotive and, and causing enormous disruptions in that industry. It is seeping into smart energy. It is seeping into medical devices. It is seeping into home appliances, into warehousing, into uh, trucking and transportation and uh, storage. Um, everything as we move forward is going to have a sensor. And those sensors are in large measure going to involve cellular technologies. I've been um, saying for, for, for three, four, five years to people, hey, you, you guys might think that your clients and your industries don't have to worry about these issues, but they're coming to you. And we're now getting to a stage in the deployment of wireless technologies where they're here or, or, they're, or they're very nearly here for lots of industries. Mm -hmm. and. As much as the smartphone wars, you know, the Samsung, Apple, Qualcomm, Nokia, Ericsson wars of the 2000s and early 2010s were disruptive in the telecommunications industry, you know, those were big players with large budgets fighting against each other. What we're seeing now is these IoT technologies move into all sorts of industries where there are all sorts of small players, whether it's somebody making a connected toaster or a connected thermostat or uh, some sort of trucking company. And it just can't be the case that the head of a, of a warehousing company that uses sensors to monitor its, 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 its goods is negotiating SEP licenses because they're at the end level of the supply chain. It just, it can't be the case that that's, that's how we do things. And the disruption from not allowing suppliers of standardized devices to have access to licenses on FRAN terms is causing chaos in the supply chain and it's starting with automotive but it's going to move to other industries unless we get a handle on it unless we fix it okay and that's going to be something we're going to talk about here today and i think um we're going to need to have a uh, reconvene and talk only about that issue at some point because that's way larger than we're going to have time to do justice for um because i think you're right i think that that is probably the biggest issue facing this space right now at least if if you asked me um so we'll touch on that uh for sure but um i wish we could just talk about that uh, eventually we will uh tim your preliminary thoughts you you've done a lot of research in this area uh which we will get to uh but what would you like people to know off the start yeah thank you gene um just you know for people who do not know me i'm Tim Pullman, CEO and founder of IPolytics. Um, we are really um, uh, in the middle of those things. Um, we provide access to, to data around connecting the world of patents and standards. And we really have clients on both sides of the table. We can call all major SEP owners as clients, but on the same way, um, a lot of licensees, implementers from the auto industry, but also more and more from new 
um, use cases as Dave was talking about from the implementer side, like smart home environments, smart factories, smart energy, those people. Um, and we really help with um, the friction and, and solving an understanding of, you know, the, the world of where patents and standards matter. And I really want people, um, you know, who joined this webinar to better understand, um, you know, where we do actually see um, standard central patents, which are actually the standards subject to it. Um, maybe also to get some quantitative insights that, that I will show later. Um, what are the actual um, topics and the actual standards that are that matter most? Um, and then also to think about and, and understand um, how the situation we have today may change over the next four, five years, 10 years, 15 years. So looking at trends, really understanding how we can solve this, because I think one, one topic we can all agree on is that all these standards, these are innovations really, and you know, having access to that is, is, is beneficial to all of us, not only to business, but also to us privately in a connected world where everything works great together. And we wanna make sure the ideas of startups um, come to market quickly. And we wanna make sure um, you know, companies like the Nokias um, are get, getting well compensated for it. So I think we, we understand both sides of the table and we want to ensure that you know we help with that. So that's that's my take on on the topic. Okay, great. So now, Tim, we're going to turn to to you here, and you're going to give us some uh, background data that we're going to talk about for the remainder, uh, or maybe not talk about specifically, but that will be weaved in to our conversation. Um, so why don't you just take it away? I know you've got a few slides here um, that are quite interesting and you've done uh, some, some good research. So what are we looking at here? Yes, you, you're correct, Gene. Just to give some background, so at, at IPLytics, our database, we really uh, connect um, worldwide declared patents of over 20 different standards organizations connected to, with worldwide patent data and worldwide data on other things like litigation, standards contributions, um, to really get an understanding of what's going on. And the first slide you see here is looking at the net new declared patent families we get year by year. So that is not a cumulative graph, that is really net new families. And it really shows how many, uh, the, the, the large and the sharp increase of, of patents declared essential. We all know that um, those declarations are just potentially essential, not all of these are really mappable in the sense that they are you know, verified essential, but still the number and magnitude shows that especially in the past three years, we have a sharp increase and there's a lot of patents, you know, and a lot of standards subject to these patents. And, and also what we see in our database that you may not see in the graph, that it's not only driven by these large projects like 5G, you know, and 4G, I will come to this later, but also to new standards projects coming up, you know, just to mention things like the Qi standard, wireless charging standard. We're also here, we have standard central patents subject to that standard like this. But of course, also things and new advances in wireless technology, video compression, audio compression. These are the major topics where we see SEPs, um, SEP declarations. Next slide, please. In this slide, we really did break it down to the different generations. And again, it's, it's, it's not a cumulative graph. It's net new declared patent families. And we do see that um, you know, from generation to generation, we do see more declared patent families again, a sign that we advance in technology, we advance in, in innovation, and that also means more patents, um, you know, in, in, as being declared essential here. Um, another thing we did and that you see on the next slide is we connect the worldwide data on um, declared patents with litigation data. Again, that litigation data is, is also international. Um, also, there's another visual beforehand. I think, you know, we, we all talk about next use cases, and I think we all agree that, that one of the first is the automotive industry. And many people are maybe not aware on how many standards are already integrated in a car, even today, right? This is not, not a picture of a future car. This is a car that even, you know, is, is sold today. So um, we have things like wireless connections among cars through the 802.11p standards. We have cars that connect to the internet so that you can access your car with your smartphone. You can, you know, turn on the heater, you can turn on the light, you can open your car with your smartphone using 4G. Uh, we have things like e-call, automatic emergency calls through 
uh, 4G technology. We have infotainment, um, you know, things like digital video broadcasting, high efficiency video coding, and then you charge your phone with wireless charging. You know, all of these things, you can open your car with NFC. We have RFID chips in, in different parts of the car that, you know, where you can identify different items of the car. All these standards I'm talking about are subject to standard central patents and all that is integrated in the car even today and those use cases will increase more and more right and i think for the better you know a car gets more and more connected to the world and it will also go beyond of course other industries smart home smart um meters smart um factories maybe even healthcare smart you know things like remote surgeries we have so many use cases you can call it uh, but that is maybe a good example of what we already see today next slide please Another thing we did to, to showcase this is we looked at the um, different adoption of the wireless standards. And the Wi-Fi Alliance here has a list of certified products, basically products that make use of wireless technology. And if you look at past 20 years, it really started, you know, wireless connections with routers and computers, obviously. Gaming starts a little bit, and then all the television and setup boxes already, you know, connect to the internet today, right? Um, and, and then tablets and phones, obviously. But what is really interesting, the past two, three years, we have things like smart home, we have buildings. So you already see in the, in the accreditation that um, these standards are incorporated in those new products and connect connected devices, and, you know, and that also sets the scene, you know, for where patents um, will be used and standard central patents will be integrated. So Tim, can I ask a clarifying question about this chart? Because where, where everything seems to tail off in about 2019, uh, is that because uh, of the 18 month uh, went black hole window for patents? Were you mapping the patents uh, on, on the products? Yeah, yeah, no, this one is not about patents. It's really only looking at products. And if these products have um, is, are using the wireless Wi-Fi, one of the Wi-Fi wi generations, um, and um, it is it is going down just because the, the slide was created sometime last year, and you know the, the latest 220 numbers haven't been updated. So I'm, I'm very sure if, if we updated that graph in the upcoming month, it will also increase. But um, it's it's a typical case of you know. Uh, where the data goes down just because the latest data wasn't uploaded and you know also these databases need some lack of time right. of information related. okay but this is really the number of products you know thousands of products you see here by category that have been accredited again it's net new so um you know yeah i just was wondering um so so, so there's not any reason to believe that um that it's going going down no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trust those 2020 numbers. We just put them up okay. to see if the share changed. No, no, no. I don't think so. Okay, great. So then the next slide, we get into some litigation here. Yeah. So um, what we did here is we basically connected our worldwide declared patent data with uh, worldwide litigation data. Um, so basically, the way it works is we connect a patent if it got declared, and then also reference in a litigation case. Um, and you know, it, it doesn't really look at the products or the infringement case. It really connects just the reference patents with litigation, but still gives you a, a very nice overview about you know the, the the main plaintiffs in the market, which are typically, of course, also those companies that have you know licensing programs because they need to enforce their rights. Um, but you see, um, quite interesting that we have you know a rank here with with leaders like Nokia, Ericsson, Qualcomm, Huawei, Samsung, who are those that are you know most often were named as plaintiffs um, in a litigation that is referencing a patent that has been declared as a standard central patent. Mm -hmm. If you okay, now look we have at this. The yeah, this is the one per, per standard. And again, let me stress, it's um, it, it really depends on the patent reference and then how we flag it to a standard. Uh, we see that 4G here is number one, 3G, 5G, 2G. People who wonder why 5G is already so high, um, I do think that we don't have that many litigation cases on 5G yet. Uh, the, the reason it is so high is that patents get declared more than once. So a patent may be declared to 3G, 4G, and then even also declared to 5G. 
And these are basic patents that are often part of litigation. So what, what you really see here is probably patents are declared of 5G that have been before being declared of those earlier generations. And the litigation in the end may not be about 5G. It is very likely about 3G, 4G then. So um, correcting these numbers, um, right, I think the major litigation what we have is what it shows is really cellular technologies. And that, that, that is really what the graph shows. We of course have also other technologies you see here, video coding, audio coding, Wi-Fi. Um, we think we have things like uh, ADSL, smart cards, NFC, but it's really the long tail of that list. So the, the major part of litigation really happens in cellular technologies. Yeah. And now the next slide we have here is uh, about SCP litigation outcomes. Right, yes. We, yeah, we, we can only do that for the US because we don't have such detailed data for the worldwide cases. But I think also that's quite interesting. Again, this is only when the patent declared uh, was referenced in the litigation. And then we see that almost 50% you know, were found to be not infringed. Of course, also we have to see that most of the cases settle, right? I mean, there's not many outcomes in, in set referenced um, cases. I don't have the number up here, but the majority of cases get settled. So, you know, that non-infringement may not be that everything has, you know, every patent that has been raised is not infringed, but it's still a high share, almost 50%, infringed is 27%. And then we have all these different legal, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer in this group here, but um, different invalidity. Um, David, if you can jump in and explain what it means. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and I have a question too for, who, for yeah. whoever, is, is yeah, when so you see no infringement, does that mean that to you, that the patent was maybe misdeclared as a part of the standard? Before, before, we, before we get to that, Gene, can we ask some basic data questions? So, sure, sure, so, go ahead. Yeah, so no infringement, right? In the US, typically, unlike say in Germany, it's a, it's a unified process, so there's an infringement and validity decision. And uh, what, I, what I guess I have a two-part question. The first is um, no infringement could be not valid or infringement could mean it's infringed but valid so do you have a, a, a percentages for a patent that made it through the runner right number one and and to your other points all the invalidity are different basis so invalidity 112 is, is the written description uh and and how it's written in 103 and 102 are novelty inventive step but the 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 other question i have in addition to so i know how many patents made it through the ringer Another, another, you know, I, I, there's data out there that uh, I think it was it was Carl Shapiro or one of his uh, other folks out there was was putting that um, found very high uh, in infringement or very high validity uh, rate. And um, what's interesting, at least in my experience in in litigation, is you know the jury likes to split the baby. And so if they're going to, if, if, you're, if there's not going to be liability and they're going to kill your patent, they might find infringement or if they're, if they're, or they might want to keep the patent alive because everyone, all those things that they say about the patent office, but there, there, there's going to be no infringement because they don't think there's liability. And so I, I, I guess, which really is a long way of saying, and sorry, Gene, I fell to my trap. Um, no, that's okay. What's the, what's the, uh, what's the, what's in the percentage of patents that actually make it through? Yeah, I mean, what do you may, see may here? Add, so, sorry, may I just add one sentence, Tim? So, yeah, first of all, I think this is a very, very interesting statistics. I just want to mention two things. So the first thing is, yeah, as you said, it doesn't show settled cases because just what we see quite often is that companies do negotiate. They are getting closer and closer. And then let's say if you don't make the last bit, then you say, OK, let's file an action and then sometimes it settles relatively quickly. In my experience, actually, I think so far, all cases I had settled at one point of time. And that, of course, can also be an indication of the strength of the portfolio because the, the defendant sees the complaint and says, okay, we better settle. Um, the other point is, Gene, just to your question, are these non-infringement cases over declaration? Um, here, I would say difficult to say because you see it happens so often, let's say that a US court finds a patent not infringed, the very same patent is found in UK infringed, or right. let's say even within one jurisdiction, first instance says infringed, second instance says not infringed, just because you see, it doesn't always map one to one, you don't have a formula in the patent, the same formula in the, st in the standard, but the patent is sometimes formulated much more abstract, You and to read it on the standard, 
gives a lot of arguments for uh, why this is infringed or not infringed. That is why we have so many highly paid lawyers who do, do, who do, do really give a lot of brain into this. So therefore, I'm just not saying not infringement doesn't necessarily mean that it was wrong to declare the patent. Well, and that's also going to come up when we when we get to the issue of anti-injunction uh, lawsuits as well, because uh, of the race to whichever jurisdiction you prefer uh, to get there first. Uh, for that reason, because the, the the rulings can be quite varied depending upon the courtroom that, that you're in, which is another really problematic issue. I mean, it's good for the lawyers. I mean, let, let, let's let's just be honest. You know, it's good for the lawyers. What it's bad for is it's bad for the it's bad for the clients. It's bad for the patent owners and it's bad for the implementers. Um, but any time that you have a, a, a environment that's good for lawyers that means it's really bad for the people who are making the economy go around um and uh and i think that that's what this ip litics data really really shows you know is that there's there's a lot still a lot of litigation there's not a lot not nearly the harmony that you would hope with something that has the word standard in it <laughs> Yeah, but you know, to be fair though, I mean, it's an inherently complex instrument, both patents and technical standards and various laws around the world. And it's it's very hard to do it pr prospectively, you know, no matter who's doing it. And when you consider the fact that only a court duly appointed in a particular jurisdiction can determine whether or not there's infringement for that particular claim that was in front of it, not necessarily for the whole patent, uh, right. against that particular product it's it's asking a lot from anyone on either side of this issue to have uh, harmony going into the going into the game yeah, yeah. Well, that's so, why go I, ahead dave I, I want to get your reaction to to all of this yeah yeah just briefly i think that's why this slide is so important what it's what it, what it says to me is that 68 percent because if you add the 50 for no infringement and the 18 for invalidity at least 68% of the cases over the last two decades involving SEPs have found that the case did not actually involve SEPs. And I think what that shows us is that licensees are often correct to push back on SEP licensing demands, right? So in the US, we have cases like Blonder Tongue, which say it's a public interest to invalidate patents, Lear v. Adkins, which says that we don't want to we, we don't want to keep bad patents in the system because then other people will be forced to pay tribute to the patent owner when they don't need to and they shouldn't have to. And so I think one of the things that we've seen over the last number of years is this effort to vilify the licensee who says no. And if you look at the data, if you look at the litigation, and I've seen studies that, that put this percentage higher on a worldwide basis, 80 or 90% of SEPs end up failing in litigation. and when I see that type of data, what I see is not bad faith licensees refusing to pay, but good faith disputes about whether patents apply and how much they're worth, and whether portfolios apply and how much they're worth. When a company says, I have a thousand patents, you know, I, I might look at my client and say, Yeah, but it looks like you know, 95% of them are junk. And 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 the and the proud list patents they pick for litigation fail 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the time, you know. You, you don't want to value someone's portfolio based on, you know, um, a couple of patents when they say they have hundreds. And I think that this notion that licensees by pushing back and by presenting technical arguments and by presenting business arguments are somehow therefore unwilling does not match with the data that we're seeing when we actually get to resolution of disputes. One other thing I'd note just from a U.S. perspective is Tim's data doesn't seem to incorporate you know the results of IPRs, which invalidate a lot more patents that are that are claimed to be SEPs. And so I would encourage. I think it's a public interest for licensees to challenge patents that they don't think, in good faith, actually apply to them. And that's what courts are for. And that's why you have to have these resolutions sometimes because people just disagree. And 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 that's what litigation is for: is to resolve disagreements despite the good faith on both sides. I, I would okay. So first off, Kent, before I come to you, and uh, I, I definitely want to get your perspective. I want to plead guilty as charged because I do think you know I have played a role in writing and talking and and uh, about 
saying that the licensees are in many cases, uh, in my view, bad actors. Um, having said that, I think everything you just said, I, I agree with, you know, I mean, there, there, the courtrooms are places for business disputes that cannot otherwise be addressed in a in a boardroom. Um, and I think that that's, that's perfectly reasonable. I think the problem becomes when it's, uh, and it's usually the minority of actors that give the majority of actors a bad name. And uh, there have been some very large actors in this space who have uh, very publicly, uh, and even at events like this, you know, talked about um, circular filing and high-fiving one another so that their war of attrition model is going to put these patent owners you know, out of business, et cetera, et cetera. That's not good faith at all. And we know that some of that does go on. And maybe what we need to do is we need to cut through that and get to the reasonable actors and and look at those. Because, you know, when you look at the reasonable actors, then I think the cases do go both ways. There are settlements, there are not settlements, there are infringement, and when, when you're, in based on Tim's numbers, when there's no settlement, it goes forward. It, it's it's not a pleasant landscape for the patent owners. Well, so let um, me just briefly respond to that before we go to Kent. So sure. we already have the tools for that. So look, if so, courts already know how to adjudicate bad faith. They know how to adjudicate willfulness. They know how to impose monetary penalties. The notion that, you know, to take a criminal law example, we, we don't punish shoplifting with the capital, you know, with with with, with, with uh, the death penalty, right? We 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 use penalties that are designed to deter bad behavior, and monetary penalties, whether it's treble damages, whether it's attorney's fees, you know, w w willfulness, and and other sanctions that can be imposed against a bad faith actor, are perfectly capable of handling this sort of minority, you know, a, a bad faith problem that 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 you may see. And what I don't understand is why there's this sort of extremism that says, well, if anybody behaves, you know, in a way that I don't like, they need to be enjoined and kicked out of the market, right? We can do monetary penalties I'm, and I'm happy to explain that yeah. to address address those types of issues. Okay, I think we're going to get to that in in the in, as we go through the because the very first point is uh, why can't we all negotiate? You know, and that's sort of like what why can't we just all get along together? You know, Kuna Matata. But before we get to that conversation, Kent, I want to get your reaction to um, well anything that's been said certainly. But if you have any thoughts on what Tim has presented or this slide in particular, which seems to have generated the most conversation. Yeah, Jane, that would take probably an entire seminar for me to give you my, my thoughts. <laughs> from an implementer's point of view, and I come from a litigation background. I started my career as a prosecutor in the courtroom. Litigation is a failure, all right? It's a failure to resolve right. the issue through a business negotiation. You said it best when you said litigation benefits the lawyers, and that's absolutely okay. true, and it should be seen that way. From an implementer's point of view, we do not look at the success rate in litigation. It is something that is used as a factor in determining risk as the negotiation process either goes forward or doesn't go forward. It is just merely a factor. Most of the litigations that end up are between very large corporations, Nokia and Qualcomm, Epic, what you know the negotiations that took place there that could lead to litigation apple and quality these are very large companies when you get down to the iot sector or you even get down to sectors where the companies tend to be smaller you have a much more fractured market which is what 5g is going to be about as uh, dave pointed out you've got sensors you've got everything becoming wireless litigation is not going to play as big a role except in risk determination on what you're going to do and what you're going to accept um i mean we can talk all day about outcomes from litigation, and these are very useful numbers, but that's not the end of the game. And that you should not end up in litigation if you actually have companies who are willing to sit down and talk. Now, we have licenses with InterDigital. We have licenses with Siemens, with Philips, a variety of companies. So there must be a way to accomplish the negotiations. And we, nobody ended up with a judge determining at the end of the day what the friend rate was. Our companies did. So. I don't look at litigation as being as near 
as important a focus, unless of course you're in the courtroom and that's going to resolve the outcome, but hopefully you never get there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, hopefully you never, you never get there because that's a place that is a business owner you never want to be. Um, and, and you want to get out of there as soon as possible if you are there. Um, as, as we saw, you know, and I never thought we were ever going to see uh, a, another epic battle like the Kodak Polaroid battle that, you know, we all learned about in law school. And uh, and then we saw it, you know, Apple versus Samsung, you know, and, and it's like it, it put a lot of lawyers, kids through college, a lot of lawyers, grandkids through college bought a lot of second houses for lawyers, you know? Um, it, I mean, I guess, I guess hate I mean, I is want good my, for I lawyers. Want my second house. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, uh, Tim, do you have a final word before we move on to the, uh, the topics? I think all has been said and, um, you know, wanted to present and kick off with these slides to get a first discussion, which worked well, guys. So, um, you know, if anyone is interested in more data, hit us um, on www.ivyleaks.com. We have a lot of reports also for free there. So look, look us up and, you know, happy to help. Yeah, and what I'll say is, you know, IPlytics is a new sponsor for us here at, at IP Watchdog. And sponsors allow us to bring these types of events to you for free so our model is sponsor driven our model is a freemium model and sponsors like iplytics really make all of this possible and make it possible to give you guys free cle so um i have no problem asking you that please check iplytics out i think that the data that they put together here demonstrates that they have an awful lot of good data so if you really find yourself in need for data and uh a lot of times you're going to need this data to take to the boardroom to convince people to do one thing or another um you know you're going to need this at one point in time or another please hit them up and check out what they offer uh they're they make this type of event possible so thank you tim um and tim you'll stick around with us i will thank you Jane. much appreciated so now uh, and I think I may have mismanaged the, the clock as I was looking in my head. So we may not have as much time for all of this, but I think, you know, we've already talked about everything except for item number three. So we can maybe move a little bit faster through this. Um, but the first topic is why can't we, oh, I went the wrong way. Why can't we just love each other? You know, why can't we just negotiate? And this comes from, and I, I'm going to primarily ask Clemens and David to take this one, and I'll ask uh, uh, David Cohen, and I'll ask uh, Dave and Kent to take number two. Um, so, because Clemens and David, th this bullet point came from the conversation that you and I had uh, when we were setting up this webinar in the first instance. So, Clemens, why can't we just negotiate? Well, let me say that's what we love to do, and 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 that's what we always do first, because um, we have some some litigations filed after many years of 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 of, um, of, of negotiations, and that's uh, now in the automotive dispute, for example, we have an ongoing litigation with Daimler. They have been using our patents for more than a decade, for 15 years, and when we approached them, it also took them more than three years with let's say very, very limited success. And that's just that at one point of time, you must take the next step. So it is never the preferred road. And as I said, um, and I agree with everything which has been said here today, also by the user side, by, by Dave, by, by Kent, we don't like to litigate. There are many reasonable people out there. There are many people who you talk to, of course, nobody immediately opens his wallet, but you see very, very quickly, I would say, whether somebody acts in good faith, really wants to come to a good solution, or whether somebody has more the intention of avoiding any payment in the end by coming with more questions, more, more propose, or let's say more unacceptable proposals, more delay tactics, more postponements, and so on. So yeah, coming back to your question, I think nobody has an interest in litigation. So I think everybody would always try it first to come to a business solution, and only if it's just not possible, then this is the, the the the, the last the, the last possibility. 
And as you said, it costs a lot of money. And I keep saying that always the cake is getting smaller. Let's say if there's a certain cake available, the more you give to the lawyers, the less, the less you have to split between the parties at the end of the day. <laughs> so some, yeah, sometimes yeah. you see people come and say, look, we have now invested so much into the litigation. Now we must get a cheaper license. And then I say, oh, actually, you see, we invested so much in the litigation. <laughs> now we must get that on top. And you see, that's that's the problem here. Yeah, no, I know. When I started out my career as, as a litigator, and you know that was always, you know, once we start spending money on this, our offer is going to go down. And it's like, look, this is not my first rodeo, pal. You know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, posturing is great and and all that sort of stuff. But you know, why can't we just talk to one another like and cut yeah, past just, all yeah, that just, BS? Yeah, just to make it to make it short, I think most people do talk to each other and do negotiate, yeah, and and really yeah. try to find a solution. I, I think, yeah. yeah, that's that's true but for they the They have moment. to be careful, right, David? I mean, because you pointed out why MPEs don't want to negotiate, and can well, you elaborate yeah, on I that? Mean, you know, there's a lot of issues, right? So, so I think, I mean, first of all, when what people don't appreciate is if you're an MPE. Uh, historically, now there's all this funding that's available that that sort of skews the market somewhat differently. But historically, uh, you know, litigation was very expensive for someone, whether it was your lawyers on contingency or your investors, and and it, it, it does you know that is a standard tactic to to bankrupt the NPE. But I think yes, DJs are a real fear. I would say though, in the SCP context, I'm I'm feeling more and more comfortable that if you actually are in fact engaging in discussion uh, 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 with, a, with an implementer as an, as, a, as an NPE and they just sue you for, for sort of seemingly out of the blue and you feel that they're being unwilling licensee by just suing you, then you know you could probably get some sort of damages on some interesting theories that have popped up for, for them just suing you uh, and not actually engaging in a proper discussion. You know, and, and so it is a challenge as an NPE to assert uh, patents because uh, SCPs because there is a lead time of negotiation that you have to have to to be right by the rule, and it does it does create challenges for you because you know you have investors or other folks other people stakeholders who are saying well when are we going to actually get the road on the show you know um, or the show on the road but the other the other challenge is uh, you know with privateering uh, and I use that term and I know people have a negative term about it you know often they are privateers not because you know companies like nokia are, are trying to seed seed the world with chaos i mean although some people might say that oftentimes they're privateers because nokia basically gave up or the other company the original owner gave up i mean in my particular example uh varingo with zte nokia had been negotiating with them and i have the record since 2002 before we sued uh at varingo with them in 2013 so that's quite a long time to try to negotiate and so that often is why people NPE sue first and and and, and license later and, and just talk later. But there is a real concern. And to go to your point about um, the, the the particular jurisdiction, what's also changed is that you know there was a time, and you can tell by the audience here, it was a U.S. game, right? Because uh, SCP litigation has always been in the licensing a bit of proxy warfare because. For reasons that I think are sort of perverted, uh, from the top-down approach of of, of uh, uh, strict proportionality, it's about how many patents you have, and it's everyone has thousands and thousands of patents because they want to get you know it's 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 a zero-sum game and all these other issues, but uh, you have global patents, and so you end up suing in one or two jurisdiction set-piece litigations, and you try to sort of use that as a proxy, and you say you know like Dave would say, oh these patents are garbage, and maybe they are. So you lower, but ultimately there's a payment that happens because of the set piece litigation. But that used to be mostly the US and then people like Clemens brought it to Europe and, and now it's global. And, and uh, you know, US that, that and, and Europe- before me. <laughs> I know, I just like to blame you. Um, we used to work together. So, um, and, and, uh, uh, um, and now it's global. And the challenge is that there are so many different rules and regimes that you have to be uh, mindful of. You know, you can get some, you know, in China, you can get all different kinds of anti-monopoly rulings against you. The Samsung is just, Samsung Ericsson thing is just one, 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 you know, one recent example where, you know, you, you did what was perfectly uh, permitted in your, you know, one jurisdiction, but in another jurisdiction is not permitted. And you can create, it can metastasize very quickly to a, a global slug fight. 
if you're not careful. And so as an NPE in the SEP space, you have to be very, very mindful how you play the game um, because it is a game on some level. And generally it will often pan out that you probably have to sue first to, to sort of set the stage. So at least when it all hits the fan, you're in a better position because the NPEs are not in it for, they're in it for basically at the end of the day to make some money. Yeah. Now, Dave, I, I'd like to get your take on this. You, you've you've seen this from a lot of different angles as associate uh, general counsel at Broadcom, and you were vice president at Tessera, and you know now you're you're at uh, your your own, your own firm and representing uh, tech companies. Um, what do you say about all of this? I mean, because it seems to me that maybe some and say, go take whatever direction you want to go in. But I know you're counseling tech companies. Um, does it matter about the size of the company? I mean, because Broadcom is a huge company. And, and I suppose you're, you're also re representing somewhat larger companies and somewhat smaller companies. Um, does that factor in? Well, well, um... So, so first of all, it's not as I mentioned earlier. It's not just tech companies anymore, right? I mean, you, you've got you know uh, trucking companies implementing a, a LTE solution. So, my experience in the industry has you know with the IoT explosion broadened quite a bit to see some of these other industries and how they're dealing with these issues. Certainly, the the smaller companies have far more limited resources to address some of these issues. Um, and, and, and in many cases have limited volumes and so are able to be, you know, finding solutions because the lump sum payment is so small that a big company with a lot of volume couldn't reasonably find, it wouldn't find to be franned uh, based on the, the, the volume information. But let me offer just a simple solution or a simple reaction to this question. Um, the shadow of the law is, is too thin. The, the, the law is all over the place, and as you mentioned, it's all over the place in all, o all sorts of jurisdictions. So it's not just that the U.S. law is all over the place, which it is, but it's different than German law and Chinese law and Dutch law and, you know, you know Brazilian law yeah. and all of these countries where people do business and need to, you know, sort of have access to the market, the rules are a little different. And so... If I'm a product company and I think that the right friend rate is, you know, based on the technical value of the patent as compared to other patents that were available pre-standardization, and I calculate that rate to be, you know, three cents, uh, and the and the patent owner wants a dollar, you're going to end up with disputes, and and it's not a matter of good faith. It's a matter of, you know, this guy's following that case law and I'm following this case law. And there isn't really a middle ground between those two issues. And as, as much as people try to find it, the positions are ex, if the positions are exponentially apart, it's just, it's just really hard. One other related issue, I think, and, and something I've heard many times from patent owners is the concern about um, legal procedures whereby prior licenses are used as sort of evidence of the licensing rate, right? And so it, it, it's a bit of a trap in the sense that the patent owner can't, under current legal regimes, offer lower rates to some licensees, even if the licensee makes a compelling case that that lower rate is franned, because as the patent owner would say, then I'm taking money out of my pockets because I'm now gonna have to give that rate to everybody else. And I've already gotten a couple of companies, even if they were wrong, a couple of companies to sign up to a higher rate. Um, it, it's I understand the economic motivation of letting the market set the rate. On the other hand, you know, with with my clients, I don't want them to be held to a higher than Fran rate just because somebody else was a sucker and signed up to a higher than Fran rate. And and so it's just very difficult until we have I think clearer rules and cl and, and more clarity in the legal system. You're going to continue to have these fights because you know. Sometimes, sometimes patentees win and get their rules. Sometimes licensees win and get their rules. And the rules are so far apart, it's just really hard to navigate. Well, you know, and this probably doesn't make the patent owners very happy when I say this, 
But I think a lot of what you just said could be addressed by transparency, you know, and but to some extent, I, maybe neither side really wants true transparency, because I think one of the reasons why it's so hard to set a friend in many cases is there really is a lack of transparency with respect to the um, friend rates, uh, what one person has paid or one company rather has paid versus another company has paid. And then, um, you know, and and I, I think the whole idea of standards is this should be somewhat easier to implement. And it's and it seems like it's it's harder to implement. We've created a system that's just harder. Kent, you seem to be bringing in the business considerations the most. What What do you make of all of this? Try that on the on the negotiation. The idea of transparency, um, I can tell you it works. Let me clarify that when we enter into a license, we have an internal policy on the license has to be struck on Fran terms. I've been around Fran for so long. I've seen it taken on many different characterizations and definitions. About every ten years, new people come in, bring in different ideas, but they have to relearn, of course, what went before them. But of course. I, one of the things I fell back on was in a negotiation. If you look at the business definition of a negotiation, it's a process where there's two or more parties with different needs and goals that discuss an issue that find a mutually acceptable solution. But the legal definition is a discussion that attempts to reach an agreement to dispute a settlement. There's a big difference between the two because there are certain fundamental things that need to be established to have a negotiation. And a negotiation is not when a company that is 100 times bigger than new blocks says, we will talk to you, which not all companies will, but we will talk to you about taking a license, but you're going to do it based on comparable licenses. That's not a negotiation, and it certainly isn't if you don't understand the market segment in which we participate. Um, you know, we talked earlier about convergence to different markets do lead to more litigation and more disputes. That's absolutely true. But what I found is there are some basic principles on that transparency note that companies don't want to talk about. And one of the biggest protected secrets that we had when I was at a large patent holder was, all right, as a implementer, I will open the books. And I know, David, in a recent article, you said no rational company would do this. But I can tell you we do that. We show you our market segment. We try to educate the licensor about the market segment. So you can see the reality is that if we don't strike an agreement, we're going to have a competitor who's not licensed, who's gonna go out and make product and we're gonna disappear from the marketplace. But we will open that up. But let's flip it to the, the patent holder side. What is a reasonable return on investment? Traditionally, how is that set? I mean, let's go all the way back to 3G when you had convergence onto a single technology platform. What is a return on investment? People don't like, all right, 10% of the LTE market. We know from an economist standpoint, you can determine within given market segments what the potential for that market segment is. You can look at what a reasonable return on the investment would be. You can also talk to the company about, all right, what is their R&D investment? What did you spend? But companies don't want to do that. But it's going to take that degree of transparency or a legislative or regulatory solution to say, or even judicial. LTE, 10%. LTE will be 12% of an adjusted, you know, of an aggregate, or will be the aggregate royalty rate based upon the average selling price of products within this particular market segment. So until that degree of transparency comes, um, Dave's right, there's an impasse, and the companies we've been successful in striking licenses with as major patent holders, they were willing to have that conversation. Um, we weren't holding out, we actually proactively which is unusual for someone at our tier level. We proactively try to seek licenses. I've asked many companies, will you touch down and have a discussion with us and been told no. We're currently being sued by a company where the offer was, well, why don't we show you our market segment and educate you up? We don't need that, here's your offer. Well, that's wonderful. It had fixed royalty rates in it, which for a market segment, which is quickly commoditized, don't work. Our product prices are falling precipitously based upon robust competition in the market, profit margins are getting squeezed, and if I'm having to pay you a fixed royalty rate set today, based on what I think that product price is gonna be two years from now, I'm probably gonna be wrong on my product pricing. My point being, we're looking for predictability in what we'll be able to sell our product at 
to continue to make a profit. And we're willing to go to the mat and show you the cogs. Um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about when you talk about the implementation of wireless patents, until you get up into complex devices like smartphones and computers, the cogs of the module that actually provides the wireless connectivity is very, very tightly controlled now. Wafers cost a certain amount, boundary time costs a certain amount. You can actually do that determination to see that there's not a, you're a bad business and you produce products at a higher cost because you're bad at it. No, we could, we could show it's in the line with the market norm. We could show you what the profits are. And then let's talk about the royalty rate. Because I don't think anyone on this call is going to say the royalty rate should be set at a point where a company, an implementer, cannot make a reasonable return on the implementation of that, that technology. I don't think and anyone on this call of, is going to say that. And that sort of brings us into the next topic here about investment versus deployment and risk assessment uh, of implementers, which can you um, wanted to talk about specifically. And as, as we begin talking about why it is that um, this is an important, I'm gonna launch a poll here for the for the audience to um, to take a look at, um, and the poll is going to ask you a, a question about Frand. And it, it, do you guys see the poll? My, my computer, I, I think, has frozen up here. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I, I just see it. it looks like maybe part of the question is cut off, at least on my screen. Okay, with yes, respect to only one line. Yeah. Please just read. With with respect to Fran, which best reflects your view? Select one of the following. Fran requires licenses, licensees to license any company that seeks. Oh, it is uh there must be a, a character limit here um on the answers. Um let me that seeks a lot of yeah, and there's so, a typo in there as well. Um, so we may not unilaterally say which one which one means what, and people will vote accordingly. I think we we've already got uh, quite a few number of votes here. Let me read. Go back to reading the the find the question um, here. Um, I, I think Gene, it's Fran requires licenses to any company that seeks a license or patent owners should be allowed to license only at the supply chain level that they choose. Right. Something I think to that, that effect. Yeah. Right. Okay, we have votes coming in now. Gene, Gene, should we be able to see each other while this poll is up? Because I can't see. I'm going to close the poll right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, the the response was uh, two to one. Sixty five percent said Fran requires. Uh, answer A. Fran requires licensees to license any company that seeks a Fran license, including suppliers of standardized components. Uh, and thirty five percent said. Patent owners should be allowed to license only at the supply chain level of their choosing. So I blame Dave's groupies. Yeah, and you know, and unfortunately, with the uh, the length of the answer and the cutting off of the question, that maybe is not the greatest, but it does give you, I think, a sense that our audience is more inclined to uh, want licenses at any level. Uh, to be made, Kent. What 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 do you want to talk to us today about the risk assessment? Um, what do you want folks to understand? I think you're back on mute. Yeah, I'm so good at doing that. I just need to work on the taking myself <laughs> off mute part. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that needs to be respected is when you do get the convergence of market segments or the traditional practices within a market segment are just as important as the traditional practices within the cellular segment. So there needs to be a recognition of that. Now on the risk side for an implementer, 
if I am in a market segment where I am taking the license and I either have to do it based strictly upon compatible licenses that came out of traditional handset licensing uh, models, or I have to absorb the cost that my tier one person has pushed down on me and they require indemnification, well, that's wonderful. We call that bankruptcy when you've got a company that's $500 million and you look at potential patent infringement lawsuits that are bigger. That's a huge risk. So many of the indemnifications you see, you need to be careful from you know, coming from an implementer side because they will have limitations to try to protect against that, but it's still a risk that cannot be, be eliminated. Now, I, I do not believe that the smallest saleable unit is the only answer and the only place where licensing should take place. I think that's incorrect. I've been around France since we argued over the guidelines over at Etsy. I do strongly believe that if you come and you ask for a license, you need to have a negotiation. But you know, I remember the discussions at Etsy. It never said you had to issue a license. It said that you needed to enter into a negotiation and if a Fran license was arrived at, you would issue the license. There's a difference between the two. And that's very important because when you look at the standard, when as an implementer, when we make a standard compliant product, product, we look at the risk of making our product compliant versus the benefits we're getting. As a patent holder, we used to look at standards and say, you know, my proprietary product, I can make more per unit off of, but I'm gonna have vastly smaller sales. But I also, if I sell a lot more units and I can license this, I'm gonna make a lot more revenue off of it. And that has proven to be true. But the thing that can't be lost is the whole basis behind the life, what happens in the monetization of the SEPs is supposed to go to support the proliferation of the standard while assuring a reasonable rate of return on the patents to the R&D people and also allowing the implementers to, to make money. So on the risk side, um, you know, it's very difficult from an implementer perspective that when we do not have cost predictability so that I can provision and set aside money to rightfully pay the IP cost, I can't tell what that number is and I am using the best available data. If I miss, that is a huge hit for most of the companies that are implementers and, and make those smaller components because the companies aren't that big and it's gonna become even more prevalent in IoT. So, so the, the question, the problem that I, I have, I mean, this all makes logical sense, okay? And, and the problem, I guess the problem that I have is I think both parties make logical sense. Both sides make logical sense. And that's why it is frustrating to me that this doesn't have a resolution. You know, I mean, when you listen to each side talk, it's like, okay, yes. And then the, the other side talks and it's like, okay, yes. And then it's like, there should be a solution. So now the only problem with, with the, um, everybody should be able to take a license is, um, when you start getting into larger larger ticket items, like an automobile, for example, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a, I understand it. Uh, um, Avanci, they wanted a license of $15 per car, right? Which, given the cost of the car, is 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 peanuts. And given the given the what the technology is going to do to enhance the car, and given that we all know that the salespeople are going to be promoting that on the lot, say, oh, hey, you know, you know, this has got the latest and greatest, you know, it's a hot spot here and you could plug this in there and your kids are going to love this and, you know, it's going to talk to you and it's going to sing lullabies to you, you know, and it's, you know, all, whatever, it's going to toast your toast and butter your toast for you, uh, you know, whatever the IoT car of the future is going to do. Um, so, you know, we have all those cases, at least in the U.S., where if that which is used to sell the item matters in the sale, then then you look at the 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 whole when you're factoring in the damages. Now, I'm not saying that the damages should be based on the whole of the car and you should get, you know, like 15 percent of the whole sale of the car. But what I think is, is that fifteen dollars for the license for the technology that goes into the car for standards doesn't strike me as is a as a lot. But if the patent owner has to then license the tier two, tier three, and lower people, they can do that. But if they're gonna ask fifteen dollars from those people, 
you know, well, now it's going to be an extraordinarily high amount of the product cost, right? Maybe not, Gene. It's remember the other thing is everyone's making an assumption that the module you're purchasing has the same speed. When you move into a V2X or V2V setting, you've got a very different animal in what that wireless connectivity is. You've got latency issues that need to be overcome. Mm -hmm. You have a variety of data load issues just for the amount of data that needs to be transmitted over a given link. You also have reliability issues that you don't have in many other market segments. So it is scalable, but what you're talking about are complementary values. And this is why I go back to economic principles. The US runs its entire economy off of this. Demian built the Japanese economy using these principles. Yet for some reason, there's this hesitancy to even explore them um, for a France setting. I can tell you that they have been looked at before, but the outcomes led to a perhaps a reduced or a redistribution of how the royalties would be paid for a particular standard. So there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in pursuing it. But there are complementary values to an enablement. I had this conversation. I know people don't necessarily like it. But if you look at the cell of a handset that does nothing but voice and has a camera on it, and it can take pictures, all right, those were around. And people forget that was an enablement at one time. And someone said, wait, if we come up with faster data rates, we actually might be able to send that picture over a wireless link. So that was done. That became very popular. It's a popular feature on a phone to the extent that now we've got these incredibly sensitive um, cameras on phones now. But the point is there's a lack of balance there in understanding what did the technology bring to the complement the camera functionality. And that's not a discussion anyone wants to have, yet it's inherent in even the processor, the module you put in the device. You're not going to put a CAF1 module in a phone because it can't do what the end user wants. So there is a there is a way of handling it. That's what I'm saying. There, there is, way okay. I, I agree. There is a okay. way of handling it. But I, I I think that there's got to be, and we're not going to solve this here on the on this call, but or on this webinar. But it's, there's got to be a way to standardize it to some extent so that the, the transaction costs of the deal making, and, and the you know the the pressure point of hiring the economists and the lawyers and the accountants to get to the point where you can sign on the dotted line, isn't isn't crazy, you know? So that where you minimize the transaction costs. And may, maybe we've okay. gone too far that way, and we need to come back a little bit the other way. I I, I don't know what the right answer is. So, so Gene, um, we're asking. Okay, hold on, we'll go we'll go around the horn. Uh, uh, Dave first, then Clemens, then David Cohen. D Dave, so Gene, I think we're asking the wrong question. Um, I I think that what you said about how patent donors justify charging based on the end value or the end unit. Um, is certainly things I've heard before, but it has nothing to do with patents law. Patents law doesn't allow for royalties that are based on technology that's not claimed by the patent, right? The the idea that royalties sure. change, I, 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 No, is, you're wrong. It absolutely does. Well, it, what, 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 what the or federal Bonar circuit says is that patent royalties need to be apportioned to the value of the patent as claimed, right? And that's what the Supreme Court has said. That's what the Erickson dealing case said in the SEP context. And so if you're apportioning the value, the technical value of the patents as claimed, I mean, look, we all know that as patent attorneys, you if you figure out a, a novel, non-obvious way to use a cellular chip in a, in a downstream device, so a car, so a, using LTE in a car, you can claim that. You can write a patent that says, I have a novel, non-obvious, inventive way of using LTE in a car that makes the car more valuable, I then right. can claim royalties based on that patent because that patent incorporates the use that's being put to in the car. If my patent is on a component that, that, that provides LTE functionality, the technical value of that component and my patent that goes into it doesn't change because I put it in a, in a toaster or a car or a phone or something else. And so to answer your question, that you have in the agenda about whether royalties should be the same at whatever level they are paid. I, I, I agree, royalties should be based on the technical value of the patent, and that generally would not change depending on what downstream device you're incorporating it into. And that's extremely important, critical in the context of standards, because what you're valuing in the context of standards, so when you say, what's the value of communication to a car? 
you're valuing the standard, which is what the federal circuit says we cannot include in the valuation. The reason why a particular SEP for LTE is necessary to communication by a car is not because that LTE patent is necessary for communication, it's because we've all agreed collectively that the way to communicate will be the way specified in the LTE standard, and we're not gonna use other technologies, and we're not gonna build networks that use other technologies that don't use that patent. That's the value of the communal agreement of standardization, the value of communication itself, not the value of the technical patented technology that's claimed. And so when you try to apply so, this value to the okay. one device, you're, I, you're I understand. The I understand path. what you're. I understand what you're saying. The problem with that argument is, is it leads to an absurd result. I mean, what it does is it requires telecommunication companies to spend billions of dollars in research, like like Cummins was saying, how much Nokia spends on a, on a yearly basis. And if they come up with a with a solution that has applicability in in a in a, in like I have a wireless Bose headset here, so if it's, it's applicable in this that gets sold for maybe two hundred dollars, then the royalty has to be based on this. And if it gets well, sold no, in no, something that is not. worth three thousand dollars, it's the same royalty. You know, and well, that, no. that that's that's craziness. That's it, crazy. It's a fair royalty for the patented technology, and by by having so many downstream devices, even if that royalty is don't consider the use. The use you don't consider the use. If you don't consider the use. So the value of medical medical devices that allow for remote surgery is a million dollars per unit. I mean, you yeah. can't take a technology and that was invented at one level and say anybody that innovates on top of that. You have to pay tribute based on the value you create, not on the value that the down, that the upstream patent holder created, right? If if there are billions of units using a patent that's an SEP, the patent holder is going to get paid, and they're going to get paid based on what they invented and what they contributed, not based on the but value. But your argument of the is they itself. get paid based on the smallest saleable unit. No, and no, the not at all. That's not, what product. that's not at all what I said. The value of the yeah, technology right. is not necessarily tied only to the smallest saleable unit. There are various ways to do apportionment. The, the, the Federal Circuit said SSPPU is one way to do apportionment. You can look at comparable licenses and apportion from there. You can apportion from, from, from midterm you know, components that incorporate the smallest saleable unit. There are lots of ways to apportion it. What's required is apportionment to the value of the technology. And the way you get there, there's multiple methods. And SSPPU is one, and there are many others. But it's never the case that you only are constrained to a, a, a tiny percentage of what you invented. You're, you're entitled to the value of your invention. And a portion right. of methodologies can get there by, by various ways. And that's fine. But if the value of your invention is going to vary depending upon the market size, as Ken was saying, which I think makes a lot of sense, you know, like if Kent ha can put forward a, a, a good case to say, look, this is our market reality. You know, we're, we're you going to use this technology in this situation and our market economics show that over the next three to five years, this is what's going to be happening. Right, that ought to be considered in 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 the royalty rate. That ought to be that, considered in the in the payment. That so if, if that's true, value. then the va then the, the opposite ought to be true when it's to the upside value of the patent owner as well. It shouldn't only be true when it's I, valuable to, to the downside I, value of the patent owner. I, I, I'm going to use a um, aggressive term here and call that stealing, because what you're doing is co-opting value that somebody else created. You, you have a patent. You had, you had control of the scope of that patent. If you figured out how to make a connected blender that had a ton of value or a connected remote surgery device that had a ton of value, then you're entitled to that value. If you right. didn't and somebody else did, then you're taking value from them beyond the no, scope. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to take the value. Look, if if I'm look, I I don't represent Nokia like Clemens does. But if I represented Nokia, I'm not going to try and get the value from Ericsson. I'm going to say, look, this is what my patent portfolio is worth, and if you don't want to pay me, that's fine. Then don't use my patents. You know, I, there's no, as far as as far as I know, Clemens, you don't have to actually license. Fran doesn't require you to actually license, does it? 
Well, let's say, let me first say a couple of things. So um, I agreed so far with Dave on many things, but not here on this value thing, because there is a difference whether I use a technology in a toaster or in a car. And the, the simple reason is the toaster sends maybe one message per year, um, please clean me, and the car sends 100 messages per second. And this means automatically that also the value of the technology in that product has a different value. You see a component, a chipset has by itself no value at all because you cannot do anything with it. It only has value when you put it into use. And that is why I think all licensors have different licensing programs for toasters or for cars or for handsets. These are just different uses and they have different lifetimes and hundreds of your reasons why the value in these products is so different. Just to be clear, we don't charge for the V12 engine or we don't charge for the leather seats or so. And that is also exactly the reason why um, Avanti, for example, takes the same rate, no matter whether it's a tiny micro car or it's, or it's a V12 luxury car. But what we all must 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 um, uh, accept, Gene, you said it right, the value of connectivity in the car is enormous. Just look at all the advertisement, the over-the-air updates, the entertainment, hundreds of things. The big challenge which we see is that apparently all the car makers have indemnification claims against their suppliers. And you see the suppliers, they sell just a small box, a black box, which costs maybe, I don't know, let's say $100, the profit is $5. And then of course, if if the car makers want the $15 indemnification from, from, a, from a component maker who earns $5, that just doesn't work. And so the problem uh, would be solved so easily if just the car makers and the suppliers could 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 agree on how to how to share the costs but since they cannot agree we now end up in this in this litigation and so i, I we feel a little bit like we are doing the homework for others well i'll tell you um i'm i'm enjoying this conversation immensely i i think that the, you know this I, I could go on with this conversation for and i what i should I should admit, Tim is the one who put this all together. Tim, uh, and I, I mean, I know Clemens and I know David, uh, you know, I know David very well. I know Clemens pretty well. Um, I, and I just met Dave and Kent through Tim. Tim is the one who put this conversation together. And I think you did a wonderful job. Um, unfortunately, you did such a good job that I, we're not going to get to spend too much time on what the future will look like. But I do want to put up at least a couple of the polls that, uh, I, I think are, are relevant. And as I launch this this net one poll about where people think that litigation is going to take place in the future, I want to ask the panel a question about um, how do you factor in, and if you can answer this sort of in rapid fire, um, does it matter the conflict between China and the United States? Um, with respect to SCP litigation in the future, SCP negotiations in the future. Um, Kent. As the person who was, whose life was threatened for, uh, by the Chinese government for SCP licensing, I, I think I should start first and say 100%. Uh, it does for a number of reasons. First, most things today are made in China. And so they get to make the rules. If you want to, if you want to build in their country, they will apply a lot of the rules, and a lot of people don't like that. And I think there's a potentiality for both a technical and legal divergence. Whatever side of the implementer, uh, 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 SCP owner, uh, you, you prefer, there's going to be a divergence, and it's going to create a lot of challenges, um, both as to technical compliance from a technical perspective, but also from a legal perspective. And it, it, it's, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what happened here with the poll, but it, it, in my screen it says that uh, we had 50% of the people say Europe, 49% of the people say the US, and 44% say China. And that adds up to over 100%. So I think there may have been a problem with the go to webinars. Maybe people, maybe people take more than one box. Maybe, maybe, maybe they did, um, which, but so, and, and nobody picked, uh, well, 5% picked Korea. So um, I, I guess it's pretty, pretty equal there. Um, so it's also it, efficient, the efficiency of the court systems and, you know, South yeah. Korea has a small, a small economy and it's not necessarily known for lit lots of litigation whereas china us and germany are like litigation powerhouses for better or worse yeah yeah 
So uh, let me try and pick another another poll here real quick and see if we can get uh, people to comment. And while, while we're we're doing this, we're we're just up at the at the hour here. Um, maybe we should go around the the horn here and very quickly um, start Kent with you. What what do you think in you know in maybe one minute if you could in a nutshell? What do you think the future is going to look like with respect to uh, SEP? I wish I had a uh, crystal ball to answer that for you, Gene. Um, most of the, the ability to access litigation, especially in light of cases like the FTC Qualcomm case, for an implementer, it is much harder for us to pull a licensor into a courtroom um, if we have to do it just based upon the contractual obligations they made into a standard. So I'm gonna have to say that the larger patent holders are the ones who would be most likely to bring a litigation based on the concept if they believe that holdout is occurring or you know, for some reason the implementer is not taking the license. Um, I caution this a bit because your question on China, I spent a lot of time in China when they were forming their IP policy going back to the 1990s and early 2000s. And when you start looking globally, you do get, and we all have our own biases because the way we're culturally brought up, you do get a very different perspective on how patents should be handled especially between companies. Now, that's changed over time because of the need to comply with traditional WTO requirements, things like that. But my point being that when you look at where litigation will be brought, it's most likely to be brought by larger patent holders between each other. And I can easily see this shifting to China if this anti-anti-suit silliness doesn't get resolved. Yeah, and the question I I just posed is who's going to be driving SEP litigation? And uh, over half think SEP owners uh, with licensing programs, and then um, the next highest was patent assertion entities, and uh, and then coming in third was uh, SEP based patent pools. Um, so Dave, your, your your thoughts on the future? Sure. Well, I, I've spoken uh, perhaps more than my share, so I'll be very brief. I, you know, as I said earlier, I think it's going to be a bit of a mess. I, I, th these issues are going to be expanding out throughout the economy. They're going to harm deployment of next generation standards. You've already seen companies that are not taking the uh, or not not implementing uh, 5G IoT technologies because of concerns over over licensing. Um, I, I just I, I don't know. Uh, how I see this ending well in the short term, we're going to need some more legal development. I think in the U.S. we might see a re-engagement by the competition agencies with the change of administration, um, but, uh, but but we're going to need some more guidance. Otherwise, we're going to have uh, you know fights for, for quite a long time and quite a lot of industries. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm looking at the time here, and we've safely gone over the CLE 90 minutes. Uh, but I would like to give everybody one final opportunity to to wrap up. And Tim, I'll give you the the last the last word of the day as the as the sponsor. Um, and Clemens, I won't put you on the on the hot seat first like I did the last time. So uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> David, David, you always have thoughts ready at the ready. Why don't we start with you? What what is the one thing that you hope people remember as they leave here today? For about this conversation? Well, I, I have two. Uh, the first is that... Um, why did I know that you weren't going to follow the rules? <laughs> that's, that's me. That's why I got in trouble. The first one is that I think a lot of what we're talking about, maybe is overstated, but doesn't really matter, relates to, to Rev 15. I think the next, next iteration of 5G is going to be a transformational in the marketplace and i don't think anyone here has any sense of where the money's going to be and it's i can spin out situations where this whole scp debate is a sideshow or where it's going to be a, a real uh, a threat to any progress and it's very hard to predict and it's, so i do agree with dave it's probably going to be a mess and my second my second takeaway is if you're an implementer talk to dave and kent if you're if you're a light if you're if you're SCP owner talk to me if you, anyone talk to Tim and uh, if you uh, get approached by Clemens take a license. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, keep, keeping everybody happy at the end. So Dave, how about your final thoughts? What's the one thing you hope people remember? 
So, you know, as I said earlier, I think this is going to expand throughout the economy and we need to be conscious of that and, and conscious of the fact that there are existing business models that are going to face disruption as these issues continue to come out. Just to respond briefly to something Clemens said, um, the market has already taken care of the issue with different devices implementing the standard. Um, the, as Kent mentioned, the you know the the IoT standards are different than the Cat five. I'm sorry, the, the the 5G Cat 15 standards. They use different technologies. There's more patents in the in the full LTE and the full 5G than there are in these devices that just SIP uh, 5G. So this notion that licensing prices are going to be the same for a blender that they are for a car, it's just not not factually correct because the devices and the standards are actually different. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I hope that as an industry, uh, we figure out a way to, from a legal perspective, find common ground and to um, you know sort of reduce the the, the level of, of disputes that we have. It would help if the courts gave us more guidance. But even if courts in one jurisdiction do, you know, then 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 you know the, the next jurisdiction is going to become the preferred place. So stay safe and uh, and 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 keep building connected devices, and we'll figure it out eventually. Okay, Kent, your your final thought. What would you like people to remember as they leave? A large part of what's coming with 5G. I hope there's a recognition that as you move out of things that require high data loads that many of the applications in IoT would be happy running on 2G. Unfortunately, regulatory decisions to eliminate 2G and now in the US 3G means that every year there's a price increase to a device that is wireless that doesn't need that extra technology. We see this in 5G because of LTE reuse, although 5G is based on a new air interface. But many of these, these IoT products don't need that new interface, yet they're going to end up paying a premium price when it comes to licensing on this theory that we invested the money to develop the standard, therefore we deserve the return. Without the reflection in the marketplace, that that return might need to be heavily weighted towards things that need those higher data rates, that need millimeter wavelength um, technology. That's not the reality in the majority of the IoT space um, that's coming. So if I'm going to leave somebody with one thing to think about, remember um, corporations have a position. I'm going to disagree with David. I don't side on the patent holder side because we hold patents. Also, or I can, or I can go over to the implementer side. I said smallest syllable unit may apply or it may not. We do use comparable licenses in our negotiations. So we just try to find a solution, but the one thing that you have to have to make a market segment work is cost predictability. And right now, it is a wild card to try to determine what the actual cost of IP is for me to implement a product. I don't care if it's at the end unit level or at the, the module level. It's impossible for me to say that with a comfortable degree of certainty. And I have to sell this to the executives and I, they're not happy when I tell them, I think this is right. That's not a great answer. Yeah, no, they never like that. They like certainty. Thank you, Kent. Clemens, you're one thing. Yes, thanks a lot. So I agree with Dave. We want much, much more connected devices in the world, good connective devices. I agree also with Kent. We want predictability. Um, let's say legal certainty certainly helps us. The more legal certainty we have, the less litigation we will see. Um, I would say when, when, whenever you, you produce connected devices, speak to the license source and try to negotiate, come to the table, find a good solution where both sides profit, both sides can, and don't give too much money to the lawyers. <laughs> well, I don't know that I agree with that last point, but <laughs> I, I, I think in the world would be a better no, place absolutely. if people agreed and were maybe giving more of the money to the transactional lawyers, but human nature seems to absolutely forbid that from happening. Um, you know, I, I think my final thought um, before I kick it over to Tim is, um, this is a mess. You know, for something that has the word standard in it, there is nothing at all that is standard about this process, at least on the legal side. You know, and um, I, there's, I suppose it's standard on the technical side, although I'm not really sure about that either with the over declaration and then the under declaration by some who would rather not have it be a standard so that they aren't 
beholden to Fran and then can go and sue and think that that's a better uh, route to follow for them. So uh, I think even on the technical side, there might be some gaming. And in the past, we have seen some uh, high profile cases of that as well, I suppose. So there's nothing standard about this. And um, that is going to be something to keep your eye on, because I think if you know, going back to the automotive sector where we were talking about for at least some of today, um, if we really are going to have connected cars and self-driving cars, that kind of a future, it has got to become a lot more standard than what it is today. Because uh, putting that kind of power in a machine uh, is going to require a whole lot of cooperation from a whole lot of people that don't, in my opinion, seem all that interested in cooperating as much as they ought to. Um, so look out for that. Now, Tim, uh, I'll give you the final word. And again, thank you so much for sponsoring this, this event. What is your final thoughts for the day? Great, thank you so much, Gene. I think it was a great discussion today. Um, Maybe to answer where, where to best spend your money, which is not lawyers, it's it's get a iPolitics subscription because you know we solve that mess that you guys describe. Um, we at least put some structure in the data, which is always a starting point. Um, and I think you know what this complexity shows is also that these topics will um, be you know remaining important in the future. We will have a lot more people on the table that may not used to be to that topic as our experts here in the panel are. Um, and we have to make sure that these people um, are able to understand what's going on, um, because in the end, we want efficiency, uh, we want, you know, license deals, um, and we want innovation. And, you know, the best way to do that in our in our perspectives is transparency, access to data. That's what we provide at iPolitics. Um, but I think it was a great, great discussion. We can go on um, discussing these topics forever, but I think we had really good points of view here and, you know, going back and forth. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, th this was great, a lot of fun, and we should do it again. Yeah, definitely. And I, I really appreciate you guys participating. And I always appreciate the audience participating uh, and joining us here today. And please do on your way out, uh, as you'll be prompted to take the survey, uh, take the survey. And certainly if you're wanting CLE, remember to take the survey. Let us know what states you are admitted in, and we'll make sure that you get the proper forms uh, as we are approved in those states. So thank you for coming, everybody. Have a good rest of your day and a good week ahead. And we'll hopefully see you soon. Bye for now. Bye. Right, thank, thank you. Thank bye you, Jim. Thank, thank you, Jim. Nice job. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for joining.